vous transmet, euh, retransmet en direct euh, cet événement. Le président Abdel Fattah Sisi participe à la deuxième édition du Forum d'Égypte pour la coopération internationale et le financement du développement Égypte ICF 2022, la réunion des ministres africains de l'économie, des finances et de l'environnement. The launch of the second edition of Egypt uh, uh, CSI 2020 and the meeting of the Masters of Finance and Environment um, with the uh, attendance of President Abdel Fattah Sisi, President of the Republic, uh, with the participation with some uh, officials and executives and stakeholders of climate action, in addition to the participation of private sector and civil society, in addition to the uh, UN officials and heads of uh, international funds agencies. It will be held from 9th, uh, 7th to 9th of September in preparation of uh, COP27 next November in Sharm Sheikh City. This uh, forum has a logo of Together for uh, World Recovery and Green Future and puts on the uh, discussion agenda in the sessions and workshops a group of priority themes that are highly important, including the Innovative Fund and the Food and Energy Security, Green Transformation and Food Security and other related uh, themes related to the climate change. It's a very important uh, uh, event because it mainly aims at coordinating and unifying the African visions towards the needs of the African continent that hardly needs extra fund to help it achieve balance between the efforts of uh, reduction and mitigation and adaptation. It also gains a very high importance due to the uh, participation and representation. This forum represents a very important step to transform from commitments to the implementation. This is the philosophy of the Egyptian management or administration that uh, explained its commitment towards uh, since participation in Glasgow uh, summit in 2021. It was summarized in the present speech in the uh, Petersburg uh, Climate Forum in 2022 when the president said that the international community has to exert all the possible efforts to support the African states and empowering them to uh, benefit from the natural resources and take into consideration the national conditions of each state definitely and uh, the, the states and the content uh, took many steps in the green transformation due to the air force and the ability to generate the power from uh, wind and, and sun moving from transformation to the implementation is on the agenda of this forum that's why the agenda of this forum is based on three main axes first mobilization and providing funds because it's well known that funds is a very main uh, empowering tool especially for developing in African countries in order to achieve the commitments of the international community 
The second X is the funding of the mitigation and adaptation agenda to achieve balance between two of them because this is one of the most important goals. Finally, the national measurements. The level of representation, as we mentioned, is very important in this forum. The, pres the Prime Minister, Dr. Mustafa Madbouli, and other Egyptian ministers, uh, including the Samah Shukri, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Dr. Yasmin Fouad, the Minister of Environment, and Dr. Mohamed Ma'ayit, the Minister of Finance, in addition to Dr. Mohamed Shakir, the Minister of Electricity and Renewable Energy, they all of them participate in the agent. And um, in addition to John Kerry, the American uh, convoy of um, American delegate of uh, climate and Dr. Mahmoud Mohideen, the representative of Arab states in, uh, in uh, the World Bank, in addition to a group of masters, including the African uh, masters of uh, environment and finance from uh, all of the, uh, of the African countries, including Congo, Guinea, uh, Sierra Leone. This is a very high level of representation and international participation. This aims at unifying the situation of African leaders to present themselves and the needs and aspirations of the African continent to be included so it can be worked upon in the climate agenda. This edition has a very high importance because it precedes uh, Egypt's host of COP27 in November in, uh, in Charm Sheikh City. In addition to unifying the African visions to be put on the development agenda, especially that this content does not contribute at all in, um, con in the emissions issue. However, it is the most affected content by the climate change. That's why President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi always puts African, Africa as a, an Egyptian priority by presenting it in different forums, not only uh, regarding COP27. The agenda of the opening session will include a speech by the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Mr. Samah Shukri, and Dr. Rani al Mashad, the Minister of International Cooperation, in addition to Dr. Amina Ahmed's speech, uh, and speech of uh, John Kerry, the Special American Delegate of Climate. In addition to other discussion sessions that will be hosted by this um, forum, including workshops related to the innovative fund uh, tools and the economic empowerment of women, in addition to many interactive themes that will uh, review the success stories worldwide. Today, we are in NASA Center in the new administrative capital to witness the launch of the second edition of uh, Egypt ICF. 2022. <laughs> خلاص فاضي السكة على آخر السكة لسه تكة كان ناس كتير شكة 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 وشوفوا روحنا لفين وخلاص فاضي السكة على آخر السكة لسه تكة كان ناس كتير شكة 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 وشوفوا روحنا لفين Let's 
تملي صحية وعينها في كل ناحية وفي مليون اتجاه عبد الفتاح السيسي رئيس الجمهورية فتاح السيسي President of the State Peace and blessings of God be upon you. Welcome all. Climate change was never. Climate change was never on pause. While we were working towards an economic recovery, we have come to realize that we do not have to choose between people and planet. We can only choose both. We need to come together because our fate is united to curb emissions, strengthen adaptation, and build resilience. We need leadership, solidarity, and resources to fulfill our development and climate ambitions. There is a space and opportunity to accelerate sustainable climate action through innovative solutions towards a just transition. Right now, the best fuel we have is the fuel of time we save. Let us act now with true intention to the spirit of responsibility enshrined in the UN Sustainable Development Goals and the Paris Agreement. There is no plan B. We only have one chance and we need to use it now. We come together at Egypt's International Cooperation Forum and meeting of African ministers 60 days ahead of COP27 held this year in Sharm El Sheikh to unite the voice of Africa to move from pledges to implementation. فخامه الرئيس عبد الفتاح السيسي رئيس الجمهوريه العربيه السيد السادة الحضور الكريم من ممثلي المجتمع الدولي ورؤساء المؤسسات الدوليه ومسؤولي منظمات ضيوفنا الكرام اهلا بكم في احدى الحضارات welcome to the cradle of civilizations egypt in the new administrative capital our gate to the future we welcome you all in the event of Egypt, ICF, second edition, and the meeting of ministers of finance, economy, and environment from Africa and all the representatives of the international community and UN officials. Our Egypt is getting ready to host and to be president of COP27 in Sharm Sheikh next November. In the light of the current preparations, Egypt ICF is held 
We are just uh, away, 60 days away from the COP27. Within the importance of the dire need to the multilateral cooperation to face the climate change, the forum aims to create constructive discussions and coming out with clear recommendations on enhancing the climate action in Africa. The support of the measurements for green transformation and sustainable recovery, in addition to providing fund for mitigation and adaptation projects, besides discussing enhancing the food security efforts in Africa. Finally, encouraging the international community to implement its com commitments to, uh, in supporting the uh, developing economies to implement their climate aspiration to move from the stage of pledges uh, to the stage of implementation. Ladies and gentlemen, dear guests, the event of the first day shall begin with the speech of Samah Shukri, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Egypt and the head of COP27. Please take the floor. In the name of God, the Most Gracious, the Most Compassionate, President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi, the, the, the President of the Republic of Egypt, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to extend my thanks and appreciation to His Excellency, the President of the State, for launching the second edition of Egypt ICF under his uh, auspices. And his honor, his honor to attend today. I'd like also to welcome all the participants in this forum that is held this year with the participation, with the cooperation of the ministers of ministries of environment, uh, finance, and uh, international cooperation. And in preparation for hosting the most important event, which is COP27 in Sharm Sheikh, as a proof. Uh, for the importance Egypt pays to uh, the climate change and to support the uh, efforts to deal with its negative uh, effects, in, including enhancing the international cooperation between all the parties. Our meeting today comes within critical moments in the world and within the momentous of uh, uh, conflicting developments that uh, put high responsibilities on our shoulders that we have to face the current political in, uh, crisis covered all the world and generated many challenges related to the prices of uh, food and energy in addition to increasing the interest rates worldwide uh, in climate change and its uh, uh, effects comes to be the largest challenge that requires the cooperation of the international community, the inter developing states uh, is trying to uh, shoulder the responsibility in a manner co that copes with the uh, SDGs and the, uh, their earnings in the past year. With the increase of the, large, uh, of the amount of uh, renewable energy, and with the accelerating pace of the low carbon fingerprint products, the challenges faced by the world today also present opportunities for development and to achieve a paradigm shift in how we deal with all the uh, economic activities. Out of this comes the importance of our meeting today. In the light of the challenges we face, we need today more than any time ever to intensify the international cooperation at all levels, transforming these challenges into opportunities for um, development and a fair transformation to more sustainable patterns of development requires a um, commitment to some principles and rules. Without them, we will not be able to achieve our aspired goals. The uh, efforts of uh, this program has to be in line with the uh, priorities of developing states with respecting uh, the um, national ownership of these programs, in addition to taking into consideration the shared responsibilities with variation of burdens, taking into consideration the different uh, abilities of the different countries. 
based upon what has been mentioned and what we have seen in the different um, discussions with the governmental and non-governmental parties, the Egyptian presidency of COP27 will adopt a, a clear approach uh, aiming to uh, bridge the gaps in the international system of dealing with the climate change, seeking to enhance uh, uh, confidence between all the parties to achieve uh, and implement the Paris Accord. Through this approach, we hope that COP27 will be a transformation point in implementing the commitments and pledges in an accelerated pace in order to achieve real penetration with regarding to um, reducing the uh, emissions or the efforts of mitigation and adaptation of the negative effects with, uh, of climate change, especially in Africa, building upon what has been achieved, achieved since uh, uh, Paris uh, conference. In addition to f funding the transformation to the new energy, within this framework, let me share with you what the Egyptian presidency of this uh, conference has uh, c came across in the, com in the past uh, discussions. The international uh, developments and the geopolitical challenges affected uh, all the countries and their ability to achieve to draft a consensus in order to deal with the climate change we hope and we seek to avoid this in term shift. Second, it's clear that there is a need for reaching an inclusive consensus on uh, the manner of uh, transformation to a low emission economy that goes in line with the efforts of climate change according to Paris Agreement. Third, achieving the climate uh, justice principle and commitment to the fair transformation force, there need to deal seriously with the losses and damages issues resulted from uh, climate change in, and finding a suitable mechanism to support, to provide support and uh, finance. Ladies and gentlemen, implementation in reality is a real test for our commitment to the accelerated and effective uh, action facing the climate change. So in our presidency of this conference, we will seek to uh, present the successful uh, experiments and discussing the proposed solutions to face these problems. Uh, we will also work on the uh, private sector role in facing this and the role of the international uh, fund uh, agencies in addition to the role of the international community as a support to face uh, the climate change, I'm fully confident that this second edition of Egypt ICF will be a very important stage in the preparation of COP27 in Sharm Sheikh. Hence, we highly depend on the rich discussions and valuable deliberations that will happen during this uh, forum. We are looking forward to coming out with strong uh, results. I'm also looking forward to the, uh, the outcomes of the meetings of the African ministers that will be held uh, in this forum, because it's very important in our preparations for uh, uh, COP27. Thank you so much. Thank you, Samah Shukri, the uh, Egyptian Minister of Foreign Affairs. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we will move to the uh, speech of Dr. Rania Mashad, the Minister of International Cooperation, that, who will talk about the importance of international cooperation in enhancing and supporting the uh, climate, change, uh, climate action agenda and the importance of green transformation. Please take the floor. <laughs> In the name of God, the most gracious, the most compassionate, excellency, uh, President Abdel Fattah Sisi, President of the Arab Republic of Egypt, dear guests. I'd like to welcome you today in the uh, event of the second edition of Egypt ICF, ICF and the um, meeting of the African Masters of in Environment and Finance that we honor to launch in cooperation with the Ministries of Environment and Finance and in cooperation with the African com uh, Committee 
affiliated to the UN and under the auspices of President Abdel Fattah Sisi. Ladies and gentlemen, before talking about the second edition, let's uh, review some uh, of the recommendations of the, the first edition of the forum. In Cairo 2021, the forum came out with uh, some uh, uh, ambitious recommendations that were for us uh, and for our partners very important uh, to, uh, to stress the uh, cooperation and to achieve sustainable development and enhance the efforts of the private sector. The forum recommended to mobilize more resources to support the developing states in order to push forward the uh, development agenda and climate action, especially in African countries. Our guests, we are meeting you today again because this year's forum is very important and special because it's held before COP27 headed and hosted by Egypt under the logo of uh, from commitments to the implementation it mainly targets unifying the visions and coordinating the situations in relation to including all the needs and aspirations of Africa in the international agenda of climate action in preparation of the funding day that will be in the conference in Sharm el-Sheikh to come out with a mutual agenda that supports the green transformation in line with the uh, sustainable development in Africa and developing countries. This year's forum will witness the discussion of the most um, important issues at the international and national levels. The sessions and workshops will focus on the themes from to move from the um, commitment to implementation in developing countries and African countries to achieve sustainable development and support of local communities in line with the United Nations SDGs and the African Development Agenda 2063. This forum and the meeting of the uh, Minister of Finance will focus on the facilitated fund to support the country's uh, reconstruction out of this the mechanisms of reducing the uh, external borrowing and the debt swap for the in addition to the role of the non-profit non uh, organizations that play a very important role in uh, the climate action, the meeting shall also discuss the social aspects that guarantee the fair transformation achieving balance between the uh, climate agenda and the development the empowerment of women and youth by training and enhancing the uh, eco-friendly uh, economic activities. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, do you guess? Enhancing the national vision. Egypt put a national strategy for climate change 2050 that includes a group of uh, projects that uh, target mitigation, resilience and adaptation by the nexus of water, food and energy. Accordingly, we launched the national platform for NUAFI program to move from the budget to the implementation by coordinating with all the national relevant uh, stakeholders and to build upon the existing international partnerships to provide mixed and innovative uh, funding tools to, in to improve the uh, investments of the private sector. This forum witnesses the inter investment coalition to support the NWAFI uh, program. It's expected to witness uh, positive results within this framework. In this framework, we prepared Sharm Sheikh guide for fair uh, fund that achieves to uh, that aims at enhancing the developing countries' ability to reach uh, the international support and turn them into fair and real investment opportunities in eco-friendly uh, sectors by uh, applicable manners that can be uh, implemented by all the parties within the fr framework of preparation. During this guide, we consulted with more than 70 international agencies to make sure that these uh, gui guidelines are in line with the international goals. In belief, uh, 
خاصة في مواجهة الأبعاد الاقتصادية والاجتماعية. Believing of the importance uh, of social aspects uh, in, in facing climate change, we launched an international competition that targets the emerging companies working in uh, climate technology and digital art worldwide in cooperation with many large companies. To, um, and we will announce the successful initiatives in Sharm el Sheikh Conference in November. Ladies and gentlemen, today we are meeting in the middle of the new administrative capital with African ministers of uh, environment and finance and the UN agencies and uh, multilateral development banks and our partners from the private sector to uh, stress once again that governments alone can never face the uh, current economic and, ch uh, and climate challenges. And the multilateral cooperation is the best way to achieve the sustainable future. At the end, we wish that these uh, discussions will come out with important recommendations enhancing Africa's efforts to, uh, to, uh, for green transformation. I cannot miss thanking our partners for their sustainable and fruitful uh, cooperation, and uh, including African Development Bank, World Bank, and the International CIF, and the Arab Bank for Development in Africa, and the Islamic uh, Institution for Funding to, uh, Commerce, and the European Investment Bank. Thank you so much. Doubtless, climate and development are closely linked. Without one of them, the other will not be achieved. For this purpose, the whole world unifies its message and mobilizes support to move forward in climate and development efforts side by side within this context. It's an honor to listen to the speeches of the representatives of the international community. We'll start with Amina Muhammad, the vice president, uh, the vice uh, of um, UN Secretary General. Please take the floor. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Your Excellency President Abdul Fattah al-Sisi, Your Excellencies, Ministers and Heads of Delegation, Senior Leaders, Special Envoy John Kerry, the United Nations Development Organizations, Partners, Friends, Civil Society, Ladies and Gentlemen, Assalamu Alaikum. I would like to sincerely thank President al-Sisi and the Government of Egypt for bringing us together with the ECA, in particular Ministers of Finance, before COP27 with a clear message. It's time for implementation. 
at scale and with a sense of urgency. I would like to applaud the leadership of Foreign Minister Sami Shukri for setting the ambition for COP27. We are meeting as many parts of the world are simultaneously facing the fury of climate change and the cost of living crisis. Lives and livelihoods are being destroyed. Climate action is stalling. The sustainable development goals are on life support. International solidarity is on vacation. Today, we must go beyond our statements and action with concrete and viable initiatives with clear pathways to investments. Developing countries need to know which financial instruments are effectively available to support their transition to sustainable and climate resilient economies. Developed countries must deliver on the 100 billion US dollars annual commitment and make up for the years of falling short. This is key to restoring trust between countries and in the multilateral system, making good on the handshake for solidarity. It is also a much needed step towards a more ambitious post-2025 climate finance goal. The needs are immense. In Africa alone, more than 500 billion US dollars will be required to achieve universal energy access by 2030. By then, the climate finance adaptation gap for the continent may reach $440 billion. The Secretary General has repeatedly called to increase and allocate half of climate finance to adaptation. The Glasgow decision urges developed countries to collectively double adaptation finance levels to $40 billion. But we still need a clear roadmap on how this will be delivered by COP27. Dear colleagues and friends, we also need to change the way that we operate. Financial institutions must work directly with you and other partners that know the situation in every country and become more responsive. We need to localize climate solutions and investments at the grassroots level within the holistic framework of the Sustainable Development Goals. And in this regard, I'm encouraged by the efforts made by Egypt in terms of the National Initiative for Green and Smart Projects at the governorates, which aims to produce a localized investment, for, a localized investment map for Egypt. Climate resilient investments must become the new normal, strengthening the delivery on the SDGs. I welcome the Nawafi country platform that has been presented us today by the government of Egypt and its partners. We welcome also the leadership of our minister, Rania, who is mobilizing the international community to get behind a pipeline of programs and projects that will make, a life, make life different and will achieve the SDGs. The platform puts Egypt's 2050 country climate strategy in implementation mode for accelerating the transition to a climate resilient net zero future during this decade. Through coordination, both the country level and among international partners, we can deliver development outcomes at the pace and the scale that is required. The UN system stands ready to accompany Egypt and support the implementation of NOAFI. The same type of innovation cooperation is needed to ensure that the Congo forest basin, an invaluable carbon sink and its populations are protected and continue to provide the much needed ecosystem services. This is also in the spirit of our adaptation pipeline accelerator to demonstrate that collaboration on the ground minimizes duplication and puts countries in the driving seat. For developing countries, the cost of adaptation is five to ten times greater than the financial support they can count on. International financial institutions and development banks must step up to the challenge of implementation. That means supplying much needed adaptation finance, simplifying the procedures of ease of access and ensuring fast delivery. At the same time, we must also foster investment opportunities that will attract financing from the private sector across the globe and build resilience. The COP27 presidency, the UN climate champions, and the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa are working tirelessly to identify those projects with huge potential for private investment. But we must go beyond selected projects. We must urgently reform the multilateral development banks to take into account climate risk and fully support green transitions in developing countries. Shareholders must steer a structural transformation of the financing architecture. 
Excellencies, developing countries cannot make urgent investments on climate action and SDGs without the necessary fiscal space. This means to urgently tackling debt. In the con context of COVID-19 and global instability, 15 African countries are at risk of external and public debt distress, and six are already facing debt distress. African countries are scheduled to pay 64 billion US dollars in debt repayments in 2022 alone, twice the amount that is available in bilateral aid. While some countries will need comprehensive assistance to restructure their debt, we must improve the multilateral framework for debt for climate adaptation swaps. I'm encouraged to see that Sustainable Debt Hub during this forum will provide a link between debt issuances and key performance indicators addressing climate resilience. Finally, sustainable investment in climate finance at a pace and scale requires private investment. We need a well-functioning and transparent carbon market that matches the scale of climate challenge and provides valuable financing opportunities for developing countries. I hope that tomorrow's roundtable on just financing from Glasgow to Sharm el-Sheikh, a guidebook for just financing, will provide some practical guidance on unlocking the trillions held by private investors. Affordable and reliable investments from the private sector also require de-risking investments in those countries which are most vulnerable. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, effective implementation depends of all, on all of us in this room, on mitigation, on adaptation, on loss and damage, and on finance for which we will be addressing in the coming days. Future generations will not remember today's speeches, but they will remember our actions. Let us rise to the occasion and together build a resilient and sustainable future, leaving absolutely no one behind. I thank you. Egypt is diversifying its energy mix and extending its pioneering strategy to every part of the country. Through working in partnerships, Egypt aims to provide 42% of its electricity from renewable energy by 2035. The country is successfully transitioning to more sustainable sources, creating green jobs, and powering a more sustainable future. والآن مع كلمة السيد جون كيري المبعوث الرئاسي الأمريكي. Mr. President, uh, fellow ministers, distinguished guests, uh, to all of you who have come here for a very serious conversation, it's my great privilege uh, to be able to share a few words with you. And I bring the profoundly offered greetings of President Biden. Uh, I bring, I hope, the goodwill of the United States of America, particularly with respect to the responsibilities to address this particular challenge. And I also bring a uh, message from the President of Peace. Assalamu alaikum. Let's I listen very carefully to each of the speeches thus far, and I don't disagree with anything that's been said. I particularly agree with Amina uh, about the responsibilities. But let me take a moment, if I may, to try to put this challenge in a perspective. Uh, I've been listening to the speeches and attending the conferences since the 1980s and was at the first Rio conference and Kyoto and many others. And having had the privilege of negotiating Paris for the United States and negotiating Glasgow for the United States, I want to share with you that um, it's important for us, because not enough people are doing this, 
to really focus in on the science and focus in on why we're here, why are we talking about this. 20 countries equal 80% of all the emissions. 48 countries in sub-Sahara Africa all together equal 0.55% of emissions. So you have to begin by framing this in its genuine presentation as a problem. President Kennedy famously said that uh, all of the problems of the planet are created by human beings. Most of the problems of the planet are created by human beings and therefore they're subject to being solved by human beings. And this is indeed a preeminent example of that. We're not here because of politics, we're not here because of ideology, we're not here even because of global strategic interests, though there are plenty of those. But that's not why we're here on this issue. We're here because the science, mathematics and physics, and a certain amount of chemistry and biology are screaming at us to accept responsibility for the ways in which we have decided to live, the way in which we've decided to propel our automobiles and to, to fly our airplanes and to heat our homes and to light buildings like this one. That's the problem. It is really not that complicated, nor even should be the solution. And it's particularly important that as we approach Sharm el-Sheikh in 60 days, here in Egypt, often referred to as the mother of the world, Umm al-Dunya, this is therefore a place where Sharm el-Sheikh can maybe help bring us to our senses and help to provide the energy that we need to get this done. Look around the world, folks. You can walk across the Rhine River in Germany right now. Every river in Europe is smaller. But 18 countries in the African continent represent the most vulnerable countries in the world to climate crisis. A drought continues here in China, in, in, in the United States, in countries all around the world. Water is disappearing. Water, which already can present conflict, uh, is presenting us with challenges with respect to agriculture. And agriculture itself is already under siege because of what is happening. I talked to one of our best scientists from the IPCC, and I said, what worries you the most about the evidence of science today? And he said, the fact that we may be passing tipping points, the tipping point of the Arctic, the tipping point of the Antarctic, the tipping point of coral reefs. And then he said, and what is a problem is it's not reversible. My friends, 15 million people a year die from the quality of the air, which is the quality of greenhouse gases. All of it, it's called pollution. And we used to clean up pollution, or try to, so the issue is we are faced with facts. The facts of what are happening and the fact also of what is not happening. In Glasgow, 65% of global GDP signed up to do things that will keep their country in, in keeping with 1.5 degrees of warming as a limit. And Fatih Birol of the International Energy Agency told us if every country fulfills its promises, we would actually be holding the Earth's temperature increase to 1.8 degrees by 2050. That's the course we could be on. The problem is not everyone is doing the things that we said we would do. So you have 65% of global GDP on a track to keep 1.5 degrees. That means you have 35% that is not on track. And all you have to do is look at the 20 countries that are 80% of the problem. We're the second largest emitter, 10% or so right now. 
China is the first largest emitter, 30% of all emissions. And then India, and then Russia or EU, depending if you count EU as an entity in that way altogether. And Indonesia, Mexico, I've just come from Indonesia and Vietnam where they have agreed they must transition away from coal, ultimately away from unabated emissions. And they must deploy greater renewable and begin to keep faith with where we're heading. So my friends, here's, here's what we need to also factor into this equation or we're in trouble. Every economic analysis tells us it is more expensive not to respond to the climate crisis than it is to respond. And in the last year alone, we in the United States had nine separate events, each of which cost more than a billion dollars. A few years ago, three, what, three storms cost us $265 billion. And this is true all around the planet. Everybody's paying the price of not responding enough. So let me just say a few words then about the frame of what do we do about this. Well, all of those studies also say to us, it will cost us for this transition somewhere between two and a half, three to four and a half trillion dollars a year for the next 30 years. Last year, we summoned about 755 billion of venture capital and other funds that went into this effort. It's not enough. So the purpose of this meeting and the subject of this and every other discussion really ought to be, how are we gonna finance this? Now we can finance this. Our economy is a $21 trillion economy. And I'll be very candid with you and may get in trouble at home. We should be doing more. We should be putting out more of a percentage of GDP, but you see our politics right now and you understand the problems. But the fact is that, that those 20 countries that are the largest economies have got to start to move more authoritatively to help make this happen. And that means that we need to help other countries to be able to make the transition too. Though it is far more important for those 20 countries to be making that transition at a more rapid pace because the scientists have told us in 2018, you, you all, everybody in positions of responsibility, you have 12 years within which to make the key decisions to avoid the worst consequences of the climate crisis. Note, to avoid the worst consequences, not to avert the crisis. We lost four of those years because of the president of our country who pulled out of the Paris Agreement and didn't put any money into the budget to fill our obligation to $100 billion. So President Biden has come in, he's doubled that money, then he quadrupled the money. We now have $11.4 billion in the budget, and we will hit the number in the year that he promised, which is next year, but we're almost at 90 something billion this year. But I got news for you folks. $100 billion is a pittance, tiny, compared to those trillions that I just talked about. Now, no government in the world has enough money to affect that transition. So how do we do it? We have to bring the private sector to the table. We have to give the private sector the pathway by which we have bankable agreements, bankable deals, that then provide a revenue stream so you can finance many of, much of this transition in the marketplace. Now, not all of it can be done that way. We can finance. People will make a lot of money. I went out to California the other day to look and see where we are with respect to technology and the ability to be able to do the green hydrogen or have direct air carbon capture or battery storage that lasts longer and so forth. All doable, they will happen. I have absolutely zero doubt that the world will get to a zero carbon, no carbon, low carbon economy. I just do not yet have the conviction we're gonna get there in time to avoid the worst consequences of the crisis. So that's our charge, Mr. President. 
to find a way to excite that private capital through tax incentives, production tax credit, investment tax credit, through pathways of blended finance like Mark Carney and others among us have been working on in these last few years, where we do de-risk to a degree, but we also bring philanthropy and bring the multilateral development banks. And we actually, what we ought to be doing, and Janet Yellen has suggested this, we need a remake of the Bretton Woods Agreement so we're meeting modern times, raising the amounts, the, the, the thresholds of what these banks can put into this effort, and exciting that capital to move in that direction. And I got news for you, <laughs> no question in my mind, Bill Gates is investing $500 million of his own money in a new nuclear plant and, and other forms of new energy. Lots of private venture capital money is moving towards this because whoever discovers battery storage that lasts for a week or two weeks is going to be a game changer for all of us. But my friends, in this next period of time, we can't sit around and point fingers. What we have to do is come together find a way to excite that capital, and find enough concessionary funding that we have the ability to de-risk sufficiently or blend finance, where you bring it from various places and you create the bankable deals that are not yet there at this moment. That is the only way I can think of finally, after all these years, that we will actually be able to affect the transition. So Mr. President, I think this is an important meeting where people have a real chance to sit down and talk about how do we really do these things? How do we make this happen? I say to all the business people here, it is not often you can sit in your boardroom or have a conversation with other CEOs where you actually get to make decisions that could have as profound an impact on humankind, on the planet, as we will have hopefully over these next months. That is a unique moment. And I hope for the sake of our children and children's children and our responsibility to history and our responsibility to now that we're going to get smart and get serious. No more business as usual. Let's get the job done. Thank you very much. شكرا للسيد جون كيري المبعوث الرئاسي الامريكي للمناخ على هذه الكلمه والان دعونا نرحب بالسيده اوديل رينو رئيسه البنك الاوروبي لاعاده الاعمار والتي ستقدم كلمه على دور البنك في الاقتصاد الاخضر فلتتفضل Mr. President, Excellencies, dear friends, I would like to start by congratulating Egypt for the organization of this very important event in the run-up of COP27, and to thank for the opportunity for me to speak today. We are living through unprecedented, unprecedented turmoil across the planet. Many countries are being challenged just now by food and energy crisis, crises happening at the same time. Europe is again facing, facing war on its territory. And the devastating impacts of global warming are more and more apparent. Every day we see the evidence of the extremes to which we are driving our climate. They include extraordinary drought and heat in some countries and dramatic floods in others. At a time like this, partnership and cooperation become even more important. That's why I'm delighted to be here today and to join with so many of you in reinforcing those values and exploring ways to strengthen them further. 
This is particularly important as we look forward to COP27 in Chamechef. Cooperation and partnership are also at the heart of our relationship with the government of Egypt. EBRD started working in this country 10 years ago. But since then, we invested almost 10 US billion dollars here across a very wide range of sector. We have helped Egypt green its economy, generate growth and opportunities for its citizens across the country. We have recently approved a new country strategy, which has three main priorities. The promotion of a more inclusive economy for Egyptian businesses, women and youth. Accelerating Egypt's green transition and enhancing the country's competitiveness. And this forum today allows us to enrich and develop these efforts and to learn from so many valued partners. I will offer just two observations, drawing on our experience. The first one is that more and more we see the convergence of vital development needs, and in particular, the importance of the green energy transition, not just to combat climate change, and we've heard how important it is to combat climate change, but it's also needed to enhance energy, water, and food security. Africa as a continent, and Egypt in particular, are blessed with extraordinary renewable energy resources. And EBRD, and I know we are not alone in that, we are really determined to do our best efforts to support the exploitation of those resources. Not just to reduce greenhouse gas emission, of course, I mean, this is the first objective, of course, but also to deliver reliable, cheap energy, clean water, fertilizers, transportation, and other vital public goods. The second observation, and this is the point that has been made very forcefully by John Kerry, is the importance of public and private sector partnership. The EBRD is a public bank, but with a mission of mobilizing and working for the development of the private sector. We see already, and it's obvious, the many pressures that all governments are under today. And they make, this makes us believe in our mission even more strongly than before, bringing the private sector in supporting the development. Egypt's country platform for the nexus for water, food and energy, which we strongly support, can make a major contribution to achieving those goals. It's so important because it brings together those vital development goals of water, food and energy, and recognizes the convergence of those goals that I just mentioned. We are very proud at EBRD to be supporting the Egyptian government in implementing the energy pillar of that platform. We will discuss later this afternoon this in more detail, but let me highlight now three key features which are very important in the implementation we are all aiming at. First of all, the first feature would be closure of all gas-fired capacity and the delivery of a just transition. Second, pillar, second element, the ambitious and rapid development of renewable generating capacity, exploiting Egypt's world-class solar and wind resource. And third element, the targeted de de deployment of public money to unlock massive private investment. This energy pillar is truly a partnership, one that can accelerate Egypt's own energy just transition. And it will really benefit the country's development also. This can also be a model for other countries to follow, delivering the shift from fossil fuels to renewable energy that the world needs more urgently than ever before. Let me conclude by thanking and congratulating the Egyptian government, and in particular, our, the president, LCC, and you, Dr. Rania, on convening this remarkable meeting today, gathering together, and I hope that we will make progress towards the COP. Thank you very much.
Egypt is transitioning towards a sustainable economy. Through the opening of the Gabal Al Asfar wastewater treatment plant, it is using treated water to irrigate agricultural land and is producing organic fertilizers. The plant has been designed to reduce waste and optimizes the use of water resources. It generates electricity and saves carbon emissions, ensuring that over 8 million people across the country live better, healthier lives. On the major role of the private sector in supporting the climate action agenda and the importance of international co-alliances to catalyze this uh, role. Now, Dr. Mark Kearney, the CEO of uh, Glasgow Financial Co-Alliance and UN Special Envoy on Climate Action and Fund. Mr. President, Deputy Secretary General, Excellencies, friends, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor for me to say a few words at this important event. We're here at a critical juncture emphasized by John Kerry. We're 60 days from COP27, as you know, and we're a quarter of the way to this radical change to the Bretton Woods system to accomplish that. It will also require the development of well-functioning, high-integrity carbon markets. And it will require the private sector to follow through, to deploy capital at scale to investment opportunities that are aligned with net zero commitments. And in this last respect, this prospect has been created by the commitment of many of the world's largest financial institutions to manage their collective balance sheets, which total over $130 trillion to manage those balance sheets, to move those balance sheets in line with the Paris Agreement. And now it's the time to turn that pledge, those pledges, uh, into action. So GFAN's members are working with governments, multilateral development banks, and private philanthropy to develop new approaches to scale private capital flows to developing economies. These range from large-scale country platforms, or so-called jet peas. They can include uh, innovative platforms like Nuefe, and I commend you, Dr. Rania, for leading that effort. And they include catalytic initiatives such as the Climate Finance Leadership Initiative and Fast Infrastructure that can deliver capital to a wide range of developing economies. GFANS will use its expertise to help structure and finance these projects. We'll use our convening power to encourage governments and multilateral development banks to provide the necessary concessional finance for just transition and adaptation in Africa. And we'll advise on how existing commitments can better crowd in and scale private capital. And that's why I'm excited to announce today the launch at this International Cooperation Forum of the GFANS Africa Network, chaired by my good friend, uh, Dr. Mahmoud Mohudin. If you want something done, give it to a busy uh, person, and he is busy. Um, <laughs> this GFANS Africa Network is about bringing private capital to Africa, bringing GFANS to Africa, but it's about really bringing Africa to GFANS because we cannot support African sustainable development without the perspective of the local financial leaders who are spearheading these efforts. Finally, let me say that we know that sustainability is about much more than mitigation, something that Egypt's uh, strategies, its policies, its actions demonstrate. There will be no sustainability without growth, without resilience, and without adaptation. And the contributions, therefore, of the private sector must be as broad. Now, for GFAN's members, 
As the name suggests, Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero are the first motivation to address barriers to finance in Africa. But within this goal, critically, it includes not just investment in finance in the green energies of the future, the energies that are at the center of your strategy, but also to helping to finance the managed phase out of legacy assets, such as addressed by the president of the EBRD. And in this way, the expertise and the capital of private finance can help Africa and the world move from pledges to action. Thank you very much. Egypt is developing a sustainable and inclusive transportation network to improve mobility across the country. By ensuring affordability and accessibility to public transport systems and reducing carbon emissions. It is responsibly connecting communities like never before. Ladies and gentlemen, dear guests, let's conclude the speeches of the international community representatives by Dr. Van Decht, uh, the head of the African Bank that clarifies the role of African fund in, uh, institutions uh, in supporting the green tra transformation in, the, in Africa. Your Excellency, President Abdel Fattah Sisi, Honorable Prime Minister, Deputy Secretary General of the UN, Amina Mohammed, Honorable Ministers, U.S. Special Envoy John Kerry, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. I'm most grateful to His Excellency, President Abdel Fattah Sisi, for the opportunity to add our views uh, on a consequential subject which many distinguished uh, speakers have already addressed this morning. We all agree that the climate, our climate is changing and changing for the worse. Your Excellencies, in about two months, we will be in Shameshek under the auspices of the 27th session of the Conference of the Parties to review progress on climate commitments made in the past years and to make more commitments. This means that the topic and the subject matter of the discussions today, which is on implementation rather than pledges, is important. Nothing can be more crucial for Africa because the continent is currently at a crossroad. On the one hand, Africans are the main victims of the excessive carbon emissions that we are witnessing today. Though we contribute the least to those emissions. We are witnessing increased frequencies of extreme weather, drought, flooding, and also desertification. And even we are beginning to see competition for agricultural land, for water, morphing 
into political crises in our countries. And at the same time, the continent suffers from lack of access to finance to develop its energy sector, which is critical in some countries to maintain lives and livelihoods. Striking a careful balance between the two, that is the need for energy as developing our gas resources and also containing the impact of the climate change we are witnessing is a very tricky one, but very urgent. It is for this reason our President Ban welcomes the opportunity that the African Continental Free Trade Agreement offers as a solution to these twin problems of reducing carbon emissions without damaging the pace of economic development on the continent. To put things into context, the most significant area in which Africa can effect change in reducing carbon emissions is by offsetting wasteful journeys across our oceans. Africa is the world's largest store of, of minerals and also producer of other commodities, agricultural commodities especially. Everything from copper and iron all to cotton, cocoa, coffee, and so on. Most of these commodities and minerals are shipped halfway around the world to other geographies to be manufactured, to be manufactured, processed, before being transported back to our continent and to other parts of the world. As we all know, shipping is the third uh, largest emitter of carbon, contributing about 3.1% of global carbon emissions, almost equal to the entire carbon emissions that Africa itself contributes. The regional value chains that the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement promises to promote can reduce up to 80% of carbon emissions that arise from the trading that is currently taking place, the way trading occurs on the continent today. The ensuing regional supply chains that the AFCFTA will, will promote will make it easier for the continent to grow jobs, reduce carbon emissions, and help also in adaptation measures that many of our countries want to put in place. That is why we hope that the support for the African Continental Free Trade Ag Agreement becomes one of the pillars of, um, uh, of the mitigation actions that the COP27 will recommend. It is pertinent to note that the funding of about eight to $10 billion will be required for the AFCFT adjustment facility that is the compensation fund, which is required to make it easier for the least developed countries in Africa to participate effectively under the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement. Let us all commit to putting this program in place in order to sustainably balance the requirements of climate mitigation and the needs of our people. In conclusion, Mr. President, with only a few months left on the COP27, it is pertinent to revisit our collective goals on mitigation, adaptation, resilience, and finance, as well as ensuring that while climate action is a universal issue, the way to which we address it must be regional, regionally owned and internationally supported. So that Africa can continue Chatting the way forward the way it deems appropriate. 
I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Ben, Dr. Rama, the head of Epson Bank. Uh, thank you, all speakers in the opening sessions. Mr. President, do you have any comment or feedback on the access that were presented today? Thank you so much. In the name of God, the most gracious, the most compassionate, allow me at the beginning to welcome you all, the dear guests of Egypt. I'm happy to have you in Egypt, the ICF, in the second edition. I'd like also to welcome all the speakers who have been objective and inspiring tackling this very important issue in relation to the climate change. I believe that the forum held uh, last September and this year's forum I think it, uh, it is a power to move forward in the preparation for Egypt's host of COP27 in Charm Sheikh next November. This stresses also the increasing importance of climate change issue <coughs> that started to be in the minds of all the world with its effects. I can say it is a top priority on the sustainable development agenda. In fact, the conference and the forum actually stresses that the efforts of adaptation with climate change effects still suffer from lack of fund. Although the, um, I agree with what is being said that pacing or the cost of the of facing the change is better than the cost of the change itself. So we are talking about $100 billion annually to uh, mitigate. Developing countries need this number. We are talking or saying that 20 countries only are responsible for about 80% of the effects. I think it's fair and objective to that these uh, um, countries concerned bear the largest responsibility in supporting the developing countries. It's very important to have consensus on a, an inclusive vision to support uh, African countries. We say that the uh, African countries are the most affected, although that they are the least contrib contributors. Hence, we need also to have an inclusive vision to support the African countries in this regard. Allow me also to tell you about another thing. Egypt, God willing, within the framework of the preparations for uh, COP27 in Sharm Sheikh next November, this conference actually comes within an international context that is stigmatized by consecutive challenges which burden a huge responsibility on our shoulders as an international community to guarantee that these difficulties do not affect the implementation pace facing the climate change that was reflected in a Paris Agreement and uh, confirmed in Glasgow last year. Allow me to speak about Egypt. Uh, Egypt has been one of the first countries that uh, put long-term strategic plan in uh, 2030. And the environmental aspect was a very important thing in all the developmental sector. In Egypt, we paid attention to this aspect. We actually moved towards it effectively in all the fields. One and a half year ago, we launched the summit for projects in, in this regard, including Hayakarima or Decent Life. 
when we launched this project, it costed us 700 or 750 billion. It may be increased due to the current conditions in the world. It mainly aims to contribute in improving the lives of about 60 million persons. We're talking about drinking water, energy, sewage, water treatment, and things of this sort. I can humbly say that Egypt, with the current programs that we we're working on, can be in current situation of water treatment and improving the, the drinking water. Actually, we treat the water on three stages, which makes it usable according to the criteria of WHO. We are talking about a, a large national program to benefit from each drop of water that does not cause any pollution in environment or lakes or in the Mediterranean. These are the efforts exerted by Egypt, and we still actually exert these efforts. The first stage will be finalized this year, and the second stage will be launched at the beginning of the coming year. We are talking about 60 million persons, which is about the half of the population of Egypt. It's very important to indicate to the <clears throat> importance of improving the technological techniques and innovation in creating a world that is free from uh, emissions. In this regard, in Egypt, we launched many huge programs for new and renewable energies in order to reduce the use of uh, plants depending on fossil fuel. In this regard, we have the chance to generate tens, tens of thousands of megawatts from these renewable energies, whether it's wind power or solar power, we have huge capabilities to which Egypt can contribute in providing clean energy, whether electric in uh, energy or to produce the green hydrogen. Let me say also that we launched the national strategy for climate 2050 that is based on water security and food and energy in addition to the national platform of nuafi program that has been announced by the master of international cooperation to mobilize uh, the cooperation with the international partners concerned with the climate change as i mentioned we have several efforts in producing the renewable energy like Ben Ben uh, plant in Aswan. It is one of the largest plants that produce solar power. The capital, the new capital that we are in now is part of an Egyptian program that is very large in smart, for smart cities that reduce the emissions. I'm not talking about one or two cities like the capital, but actually we're talking about more than 20 cities established in Egypt. We, we chose this despite uh, that it stresses uh, at the economic level. And within the current conditions in, in the world uh, over the past three years, This stresses us because we work in this program with its uh, financial burdens within our understanding and our responsibility to our countries in a very huge issue like the climate change. The green investments in Egypt percentage became now, uh, has become now 40% of the total general investments. In fact, during 2024, these investments will be 50% of the total investments. Egypt did not highly contribute in emissions. Actually, it is about 0.6% uh, in the total emissions. But, however, we are one of the highly affected countries by the climate change. 
despite the fact that uh, 20 countries worldwide are the main cause for climate change and making emissions while other countries like Egypt and the African countries too have the least contribution they are highly affected within the light of my comments or in other words, let me comment on what Ms. Amina Mohammed said. It's very important to commit to achieve the uh, climate, uh, climate action agenda, which has to be in line with the SDGs and the uh, sustainable development agenda, because both of them play a huge role in uh, determining the destiny of the humanity. In addition to the coordination of all the international efforts and providing support to the uh, victims of the environmental uh, crisis. I'd like to um, second the, in, uh, the inspiring uh, speech of John Kerry, the uh, climate envoy, uh, and uh, I'd like also to second the objectivity of his speech and how he appreciates and estimates that the size of this challenge and how to participate and solve it. We are looking forward to more cooperation with the United States in mitigation and adaptation uh, with climate change effects in Africa, especially with in relation to establishing more renewable and new energies plants and sewage treatment uh, plants and in addition to the technical support to the developing countries. I really praise the growing uh, partnership with, between Egypt and the European Bank. We are looking forward to build upon this cooperation, enhancing it in the coming period. You will find that in Egypt we have projects that are well studied and strong. In addition, they provide an excellent contribution in this field. The support of the European Bank will have a high effect in implementing these projects within the best timeline. I'd like also to praise the um, priorities of the governmental action program in, in Egypt and these policies of the European Bank represented in supporting the transformation to green economy and uh, the empowerment of the private sector that has the ability to bridge the gap uh, in financing this, um, these uh, uh, large projects. Once again, I'd like to welcome you, wishing you all the guidance and success in this forum. Next November in Sharm Sheikh City, we will move effectively and strongly for this very important topic for the whole world. Thank you so much. Thank you, Excellency President, for your honor with the attendance and your effective participation. Let's all um, move from the stage of the ledges to the implementation. Excellency, uh, I'd like uh, to take your permission for a short break, then we'll resume this forum.